Um, I want to invite you, if you brought your Bible, to open your Bible to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. Um, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. We've been spending um, several weeks, uh, going on about two months, studying the miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Mark. Um, and today we're going to continue um, with those miracles. Uh, last week, um, we saw an interesting story. We saw a miracle, but we were concentrated more on the story of where this uh, Phoenician woman, a Greek woman, a foreigner, comes to Jesus and asks Jesus for uh, a miracle uh, to, to free her daughter, to deliver her daughter. And uh, Jesus uh, told her, you know, it's not right for me um, to feed the puppies before I feed the children. In other words, I've come for, for, for the children, for the family first. And, um, and, and I love her response. She's such a, a, a tenacious woman, right? They didn't give up. Uh, responds with, well, you know, even the puppies, even the little dogs get a little bit of table scraps, you know, from under the table. And in the lesson we, we, we spoke about and learned, that uh, so many people are, um, um, for them it's enough to get table scraps. Um, they're, they're um, me se conforman con, it's so funny because in Spanish service I'm always struggling to come up with words in Spanish because English is my dominant language and right now I'm, I'm totally struggling to come up with the English word for se conforman, um, they're, um, they're content, right? They're content with, um, with table scraps uh, but Jesus came, gave up his life. He, he, he left the glory of heaven, came to earth, was, um, gave up his life. He was arrested. He was beaten. He was scourged. He was crucified. He's buried. Three days later, uh, raises up from the dead. He goes through all of that so that you and I would not be like little puppies under the table waiting for table scraps, but that instead we would be transformed, right? Uh, we have a dog in our house, Mia. We used to have two, and Amira uh, passed away a couple of months ago, but, you know, I, I consider Mia part of the family, but she doesn't need at the table. <laughs> like we don't have a chair for her at the table. Like, you know, here you go. No, no. She, she's, and she, and I, I think I shared with y'all last week a picture of where she waits for the baby to drop something for her. Uh, don't be content with that. Uh, Jesus came so that you could have, be part of the family and you could have a seat at the table, not under the table, but a seat at the table and that you would be co-heir with Jesus, that, that the promises uh, would also be for, for you and would be for me. But I will tell you something that when you and I are a part of a family and especially when we are a part of the family of God, being part of a family comes with responsibilities. Right? Being part of a family comes with, with, um, with obligations. I was remembering at 8 a.m., Last night I didn't get to preach because we had a, a night of worship, and so um, so this message started at 8 a.m. And I, I was sharing with with uh, those that came at 8 a.m. because I was seeing my parents uh, both sitting um, sitting there on the side. And I was remembering when we were kids, um, we had obligations at the house. Uh, my brother and I, we were sort of in charge of the, of the outside part. Uh, you know, we, we would cut the yard and my parents have, had this huge yard. They still have this huge yard. So we would cut the yard. Um, every once in a while, my brother would get the weed eater. And, um, you know, and that, that was sort of our part. Uh, uh, from an early age, we started serving in the church uh, along with my father. My brother was, uh, was a, a worship leader for a long time. He's the one that started what we call the spot. Back in those days, we called it just simply youth service. Um, he's the, the one that helped start um, the school, Pueblo's Royal Christian School. We had, a, we had a commitment and obligation to the family. My sister, she had a commitment and obligation to the family. She took care of a lot of stuff that was inside. She, she washed dishes, she vacuumed, she cleaned. Um, even today, you know, uh, we often will get together at my mom's house and, uh, and, and she'll stay behind and she will finish uh, cleaning up behind uh, after the rest of us. Uh, there's a commitment when someone is a part of a family. And the same is true when we are a part of the family of God and, and when we are a part of a family such as here at Pueblo's Church, like part of a church family. Something that happens sometimes is, is um, you know, someone will come into church. I needed to speak to the pastor, right? And I'm like, okay. And uh, they don't come to this church. They don't go to any church. And they will, they will ask, they're like, how much, how much do you charge uh, to rent the sanctuary and for you to marry us, right? And so my first question is always, what church do you go to? First of all, let's, let's start there. What church do you go to? And oftentimes they'll be like, well, we, we don't really go to church. And I'm like, Man, that's the problem right there, right? They, they want the benefits that come with being a part of the family, the benefits that come with being part of a church, but they don't want the commitment that comes with being part of the family, with being part of the church. They don't want the commitment of coming 
uh, you know, weekly to praise and worship with us. They don't want the commitment of growing with us um, through, through Bible study, through studying the Word of God. They don't want the commitment of, of giving their tithes or their offering, but they want the benefits, you know. And, and we see this today in marriages. This is going on in marriages. Um, I, I read uh, in a, uh, somewhere a couple of weeks ago or maybe a couple of months ago um, something that said that, like, the average wedding today is about $35,000. I'm like, jeez, right, you know. 35, the average wedding today is like $35,000 Put a down payment on a house instead, you know, get married in the backyard. I'll marry you under one of our trees in the back of the church, you know, like, you know, like, that, that's a lot of money. If you've got it, praise the Lord. All right, praise the Lord. Go at it, right? If you've got it, go at it. We had a big wedding. We had it. Go at it, right? But, you know, don't go into debt for that, right? But anyways, the average wedding is like 35000 and and people will invest. That's a lot of money to invest in a wedding, but they will invest very little in their marriage, they will invest very little in the marriage. They're having trouble. We'll go to counseling. Oh, it costs. You spent $35,000 in a wedding and you don't want to pay, you know, $80 for an hour of counseling. Like, like you know, priorities are, are, are messed up. And so many people, they want the wedding. They want the photos. They want to post it online. Photo dump of our wedding, right? They want to put, you know, all these pictures, you know, online. They want their friends to like, to comment, to share. They want the prima to be like, ¿Por qué no me invitaste? Right? Why didn't you invite me? They want all of those things, right? But then, first morning after honeymoon, husband looks at his wife and says, I've never seen you without makeup. <laughs> right? A couple of weeks after the honeymoon, the wife is like, oh, wait, wait, wait. You were expecting that I was going to cook every day? You used to take me out to eat every day. I thought that that's how it was just going to be a continuation. You expect me to wash dishes? You expect me to vacuum? Like, whoa, 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 whoa. And there are some husbands that they're like, wait, 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 wait. You expect me to work? You, 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 we're not going to go 50-50? All right? 50-50? That's not in the Bible. 50-50 is not in the Bible. Just letting you know. All right? They want the benefits, the beauty, the traditions, of a wedding, but the marriage, argh, pump the brakes, right? Pump the brakes. Being a part of a family comes with obligations and with commitments. Right? Oftentimes I had to tell my friends no, because I have an obligation and a commitment with my family, right? As a married man with uh, three, three girls, and primeramente Dios, a boy in November, we're praying, right? We're going to find out in November if you guys really prayed. <laughs> Just pray for a happy, healthy pregnancy. But um, there, there are times that I have to say no to even my parents or to my friends or even stuff that has to do with church because I have obligations and commitments because of my family. And let me tell you that in the same way, when you and I came to Christ, when we were transformed from puppies waiting for table scraps, for some good luck to happen to come our way, and we were transformed to children, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. There's a verse that says that God's will is that we would be brothers with Jesus and Him first amongst us. When we were transformed to, hey, you know what, this is your seat at the table. But guess what, there's also commitment and obligations that come with that. Sometimes we've got to carry our dishes to the sink. Naeli teaches the girls to take their dishes to the sink. Naeli teaches the girls to put up their Barbies. I don't know how it's possible, but they will play with 35 Barbies at one time. I'm like, I only have two hands. I don't know how they play with 35 Barbies at one time. But once Naeli says, we're about to leave, once Naeli says, it's time to start getting ready to go to bed, they start opening certain drawers and they know which Barbies go in what drawers and they know what dresses and shoes and accessories go in, in, the, other, in the other drawers because they're, we're teaching them that if you're part of Villa, Casa Villarreal, that's gonna come with some obligations and with some commitments, right? And if you're going to be a part of the family of God, if you're going to be a part of the church, it comes with some obligations and some commitments. 
Some of you have stepped up on those obligations, those commitments, and that you participate with your tithes and offerings. Some of you have stepped up with those obligations and those commitments and that you're here weekly for, for praise and worship. Some of you have stepped up in that commitment, that obligation, and that you're inviting people to come and hear the good news. Some of you have stepped up in that commitment and obligation that you serve, that you serve in a service. And we wanna encourage everybody to pray and ask God, God, how can I serve in the church? How can I be a part of what you're doing here at Pueblo's Church? With that as our basis for today. Let's go ahead and read Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Mark chapter 7, verse 31 says, Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the 10 towns. So there's these 10 towns that were kind of near each other. And this is Gentile uh, territory. This isn't Israel. This isn't Jewish territory. This is Gentile territory. Verse 32 says, a deaf, a, a deaf, I'm, telling you, I'm in Spanish mode. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. And Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears, then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongues. Let me tell you something real quick. Um, a couple of years ago on Wednesday nights, Wednesday and Thursday nights, we used to have this service. Wednesday was in Spanish, uh, Thursdays was in English. And I would preach on healing. And then we would all move to that wall and we would make like a single foul. And I would pray for, for everyone individually. And um, one day I was preaching on this portion where it says that Jesus, a blind man came to Jesus and Jesus got some dirt, spit in it, made some mud and put it on his eyes. So I said, everyone who's wearing glasses, go ahead and come forward. Nobody came forward, right? You know, everybody was like, like they're like, no, no, we're not going to let pastor do that. So then we, another time we were, we were uh, reading this portion. So I was like, if anyone is deaf, no, nobody wanted pastor to stick his fingers in there. And believe me, I didn't want to do it either. I was just, it was just, I don't know. Anyways, let's continue reading verse 34. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, um, Ephatha, which means be opened. 35. Instantly, the man could hear, he could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. And they were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Let's all together three times, let's read out loud the first part of that quote where it says, everything he does is wonderful. I love that. Let's read, let's read that part out loud, everyone. Everything he does is wonderful. One more time. Everything he does is wonderful. One final time. Everything he, does. Is one, everything he does is wonderful. Let's pray before we get deeper into the teaching. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share the good news. I thank you for everyone that today said present and made it to Pueblo's Church this afternoon. I thank you for all those that are listening through radio or watching on social media or however they'll get this, receive this message. I ask, Lord, that you would give us grace and favor before each other, that you would open up our eyes, that you would open up our ears to be able to receive what you have for us today. I ask on behalf of myself that you would give me the words and the wisdom I need to bring a message that's going to be a blessing to us all. I ask for a fresh unction. Fill us all with your Holy Spirit and help us to learn to depend more and more on your power. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's read uh, verse 31 once again, Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Ten Towns. There's a lot of moving around, right? He left Tyre. He goes up to Sidon. He goes back to the Sea of Galilee. And if you've been following along with us um, these past uh, couple of weeks, probably past two months that we've been studying the miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Mark, we will see that Jesus has been in synagogues, that he's been in homes, that he's been in different people's homes, that he's gone to different cities. He, he, he's been close to the, to the, to the, to the tombs uh, where, where he delivered a man there. Um, he's been on boats. He's been out in the fields. He's been up on, uh, up on the hills or, 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 the, or the mountains to pray. Uh, we see Jesus all over the place. He's just moving around, doing what we would call today, doing ministry, moving around, ministering just all over the place. 
The, I don't remember if it was the first week or the second week that we started studying this, but back in um, Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 38, uh, Jesus says, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. Jesus came to preach, to preach the good news. What are the good news? The good news is that you and I were lost, that you and I were puppies under the table waiting for some good luck or some table scrap to fall. The good news is that you and I, as sinners, we were destined for hell. But God had a plan and his plan came to fruition when he didn't send a man, he didn't send an angel, but he sent his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus came to preach those good news that there is salvation and there is healing and there is deliverance through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is like, hey, I've got to move. I've got to go. We've got to go here. We've got to go there. We've got to preach over there. We have to take this good news all over the place. And we see him moving around from towns to towns to villages to villages, from cities to cities, from regions to regions. Even ventured outside of where he, he, his, his main intent was to be. And before Jesus ascends back to heaven and acts... He tells his followers these words in Acts chapter 1, verse 38. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know what that's saying? That's saying that, hey, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive power to be witnesses from Jesus, to tell everywhere, everyone about Jesus in Houston, in Texas, in the United States, and to the ends of the world. There's a commitment. There's an obligation to take the good news. Jesus says, go and make disciples. And let me tell you that that commitment, that obligation is not just for me. And I want to tell you something as well, something that me personally as pastor, I have to take very serious, is that that commitment and that obligation is not just for me on Sundays. I can easily be like, well, you know, I mean, I preach, I preach Saturday morning, I preach Saturday night, I preach three times Sunday, I think I did my part. No. I, just like you, I too have the commitment, the obligation to take the good news elsewhere. But at work, you're, 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 the, you're, the, you're the pastor there, you're the preacher there, you're, you're, the, you're the priest there, whatever term you want to use. Some of you in your homes with your families, you're the first one to put your faith in God, to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to commit your life to following Jesus. Well, guess what? Amongst your family, you're the pastor, you're the preacher, you're the teacher, you're the priest, whatever word you want to use, but you're the one called to take the good news, the gospel of Jesus out there. And I know that when I say these things <clears throat> that, hey, we, we are called to go out and take the good news. The first thing that comes to mind for a lot of people is like, Pastor, I don't know how. I don't know how to share my faith. I don't know how to, to, to share the good news. Well, the very first thing that I would tell you, my biggest advice to you, especially if you're a member here at Pueblo's Church, my biggest advice to you is join discipleship class. Next semester that discipleship class starts, join discipleship class and get a good foundation and understanding of what is it that we believe as, as believers in Jesus Christ. What do we believe about salvation? What do we believe about baptism? What does the Bible say about these things? If possible, join ministry class afterwards. But I'm gonna share with you quickly, because it's not the main intent of my message, but I'm gonna share quickly with you something that you can share whenever you're, you're trying to share your faith or you wanna tell someone about Jesus. Uh, first of all, I mean, there's an easy verse. Everybody here should have memorized John 3, 16. You see it at all the football games, right? Somebody lifting it up. If that's the IRS, tell them I'll call them later. No, I'm just kidding. Right? I mean, learn John 3, 16. Memorize John 3, 16. Internalize John 3, 16. Write down in two minutes, record yourself in, for two minutes, how would I share with my cousin salvation using John 3.16. Okay. 
Three verses that I really highly encourage everyone to memorize. And I've used these verses many times and I've taught on these verses many times and I've shared these verses with you many times on sharing the gospel. If you wanna take a picture of the screens, there's a good moment to take a picture of the screens or write it down. But Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23 and Romans 10 verse nine. Romans 3.23 teaches us for all have sinned, everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Romans 6.23 teaches us, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And then Romans 10.9 teaches us that if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, and Romans 10. Um, nine. I've used those, these verses so many times in the past where I'm talking to someone about Jesus and, and I'll just guide them. You know, the Bible says, and the Bible says, and the Bible says, right? Don't, don't go around telling people, you know, my pastor says, please don't go around telling people that. Right? Say, the Word of God says, the Bible says, Scripture says, right? God promises, right? Don't, don't go around, oh, Pastor Ruben says, like, please do not be, be saying that, right? If I told you a joke and you want to share the joke, okay, maybe. But other than that, I'm just kidding, right? But Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, and Romans 10, 9, you know, we just, it, it, I, didn't, I didn't plan this because I'm not, I'm not that forward thinking. But it's kind of funny that the testimony, we had a testimony today, the testimony is about serving, and, and today I, I happen to be teaching on uh, being responsible, um, be, having responsibilities and commitments when we're part of the family of God. And, um, but, you know, you, you saw the testimony, you saw what they spoke about, you saw how they talked about how serving has helped change their lives, how serving has helped them learn more about the Word of God when they have to learn the stories to share with the kids. They've had to learn more. You know, Cynthia talked about how uh, uh, she didn't grow up like her husband, Edgar, who grew up in a, in a Christian household. She grew up in a household that, that she didn't, they didn't know Christ. They didn't talk about God. They didn't talk about the Bible. And, and she uh, recognizes that she suffered a lot. She went through a lot of heartache because she didn't have those things in her her life and, and that she's glad that now that her, her children and she's getting to so in other children that um, that they won't have to make the same mistakes that she made that she made because uh, these kids are receiving truth they're receiving promises they're receiving the Word of God in their life what's God done in your life how's God changed and transformed your life let me tell you that there are people that can debate with you all day long about the Bible but no one can debate with you what God is doing in your life the vast majority of, uh, uh, of you that are present, you're not going to go and get a PhD in theology, but you have the PhD in the, your testimony. You have the PhD. You are the expert. You've written the thesis. You've lived the thesis of what God has done and is doing in your life. And you should be sharing that. I remember I was sharing last service that years ago, there was this young man. He used to come to our church. He was older than me. I was, I was a kid. I was like maybe like 10, 11. He was probably like 18, 19 years old. And I remember one time before church, this is a long time ago. This is back when we had Walkmans. Some of y'all don't know what a Walkman is, but um, he, he had a Walkman. It was a cassette Walkman. And um, we, were, we were outside and he was under this tree. We weren't even in this church. We were in a totally different church. And, um, and so I went over there, sat with them. It was before church. I used to go early with my dad and I was just hanging out with this guy from church. And so I asked him, I'm like, hey man, what are you listening to? And he told me, he goes, you know, he goes, when I came to Christ, and he, he was like early 20s, you know, late teens, early 20s, he goes, when I came to Christ, God transformed me so much that he even transformed my, um, what I like to listen to. He's like, I used to, I used to love listening to heavy metal, to like really dark, heavy music. And he goes, and God transformed me so much. He goes, look at what I'm listening to. He was listening to classical music. Right? Man, that's his testimony. That was his testimony. Like, like that was for him, him to share and, and that God still transforms people. God still transforms and renews our minds and our hearts. Write down your testimony. Write down a two-minute testimony. Record yourself a two-minute testimony that if I have the chance to tell someone what God, what Jesus is doing in my life, this is what I would tell them. You're the expert at it. Memorize a few verses. Learn your own testimony on how you would share it. The third thing I would share with you on sharing the faith, because we're disciples of Jesus and Jesus shared his faith. Jesus uh, preached the good news. We're disciples of Jesus. We too are supposed to preach the good news. 
We're disciples of Jesus. Jesus went out. We too are supposed to go out. Learn some verses. Learn your testimony. The last thing I'll encourage you, and you've heard me encourage you a lot in the past couple of years, have a one in your life. A one is someone in your life. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a coworker. It could be la prima um, that does not know Jesus or is not following Jesus, is not living for Christ, and you're just constantly sowing in her life, his life, in their lives. You're constantly praying for them, asking God to, to bring salvation to their lives, asking God that wherever they're at, to send someone to talk to them about Jesus. Jesus, asking God that they would leave the party scene, asking God that they would leave the, the, the hooking up scene, asking God that they would leave the drug scene, asking God that, that, that they would commit their lives to him and serve him through, through his son, Jesus Christ that you're meeting with them and you're looking for, how can I serve them? I've shared with you about my one, my one, um, he, he's, a, he's a young dad. He has a good job, but I still, whenever I see him, I'll give him money and tell him, hey man, this is for diapers for the kids. You know, so uh, looking for those ways that you can serve your one. Let's continue reading to uh, verse uh, 32. Verse 32 says, a deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him. And the people begged Jesus to lay his hand on the man to heal him. Notice this that a deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him and the people begged Jesus. And we, we've been studying these miracles and we have seen over and over and over that there's this common theme of people changing their position and their posture when it comes to Jesus. They change their position and that they keep coming to Jesus. And then when they come to Jesus, they change their posture. Some of them fall on their knees. Some of them will worship him. Some of them will beg him. In this case, they, they begged him. It's, it's a sense of, of humbling themselves before Jesus. Today, you did something very similar in that, hey, you woke up and you could have said like, ah, you know what, it's already gonna be noon. Let's go eat lunch. But instead, you came, you drew closer to the Lord. Right? And, and th this time that we spent singing these songs and some people raising their hands, some people crying, some people clapping. Like, it's not just like music for entertainment. No, we are worshiping God. We are humbling ourselves to God. We're honoring God so much that we are singing to him. So change the position, change their posture, change your position, change your posture. I was laughing in the earlier services with, with the hermanos because I was telling them, that, man, the year's going by so fast and before we know it, it's going to be December, January, February. And it's, it's gonna be kind of cold, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, some Sunday mornings, you know, you're gonna wake up and the San Marcos is over you, that thick blanket is over you and you're just gonna be like, Ugh. it's kind of nice, right, under here. But some people, they're going to wake up and they're going to be like, ah, oh, it's kind of cold. I mean, we'll just have some coffee or some hot chocolate here with the kids and we'll, get, we'll go to church next week. Right? I know none of y'all. I'm talking about the ones that didn't come to church today, right? Like that. I don't know. You guys, you, man, you, 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 you guys, you're like, you're like the rangers. You're like the, the postal service. Y'all don't care if it's rain, if it's snow, if it's sleet, right? Like, y'all don't care. Y'all are coming to church, right? I, I know that. Thank you, for, thank you for being like that. I, I was talking about the other guys who didn't make it to service, right? Well, we have to understand the importance of changing our position, coming closer to Jesus, changing our posture, humbling ourselves before him and the importance of doing it on behalf of others. The, somebody brought this man to Jesus, and not only did they bring him to Jesus, but they begged on his behalf. They advocated for him. Who are you bringing to Jesus? Who are you advocating for? Who are you interceding for? Who are you speaking on behalf imploring God to do a miracle in their lives, to, to save or to heal. We can learn a lot just from these people here. Change your position, change your posture. Verse 33. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears, then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to the heavens, he sighed, verse 34, 
Looking up to the heavens, he sighed, Ephatha, which means be opened. And instantly, verse 35, the man could hear perfectly and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Let's go back to verse 33. Verse 33 says, Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. And he put his finger into the man's ears. But let, let's stop right there. I'm sorry, let, just the first sentence. So Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. You know, Jesus is so compassionate. He's so compassionate. I like how Jesus like took him to the side so that they, they, they could be alone. Like he gave him his, his attention, right? Like he, he met his need, but it wasn't, you know, it, it, it wasn't in, in this like rush thing. It wasn't in this like, oh, well, you know, I'm kind of busy type of moment. Like, like no, like, like he, he gave him like some one-on-one -on -one time, right? He, he showed him love. He showed him attention. He showed him compassion. I think that oftentimes this, this is a part that, that many of us, we, we, we struggle with and that we are called to show others love, to show others compassion, to, to help others, to meet their needs. I don't know uh, how many of you have a Bible that has titles in your Bible, like over your chapters, sometimes there are titles. Uh, what, what's the title on some of your, what, what's the title over chapter seven? Like if you went right to the beginning, chapter seven, verse one, what's the title over it? It heals the death. Right over verse one, over chapter seven, verse one, on, my, on mine, um, I know we all have a bunch of different versions, but on mine it says, Jesus teaches about inner purity, right? About inner purity. Right? He's, he's teaching about, about cleanness, right? Now, in the Old Testament, there were certain things that people went through that the, that the persons were considered impure, right? Impure unclean. For instance, we saw a few weeks ago, this woman with a blood flow. She came and touched Jesus. That woman was considered unclean. She was considered impure because of, of her blood flow. We, we saw a leper where Jesus healed a leper. That leper, he was considered unclean. He was considered impure. In, in the time of Passover, God tells his people, he says, look, you're going to get a lamb, one year old, male, with no defects, sacrifice him, and then you bring it to, to me. And if you pay attention that all the sacrifices that God asked for, they had to come from animals, rather they were lambs or goats or bulls or doves, but they had to be animals that were pure with no defects. Leviticus teaches that someone who had a defect could not serve. They couldn't serve the sacrifices. That means that the guy with the withered hand, he wouldn't have been able to serve. This guy, deaf, stuttering, he, he, he wouldn't have been able to serve. These are what today we would call outcasts. Outcasts, marginalized people, pariahs. And oftentimes we see, we see people, that today we would say they're difficult. We see people that are difficult and we don't really want to deal with them. This week that just passed, we were uh, talking about um, how we arrived here at this sanctuary. I was meeting with some architects and, um, and they, I was sharing with them the story of how we arrived here at this sanctuary. And, and, and part of the reason that, that we arrived here at, at where we're at is because uh, there was a change in demographics and a lot of the churches that were in this area serving the community, they decided we don't want to deal with that change in demographics. We don't want to deal with those people. And they moved to the newer part of town, the nicer part of town, the rich part of town, you know, where most of y'all live. Oh, uh, there we go, man. In the last service, nobody said amen. I'm, I'm trying to help y'all out, right? And, you know, I asked at 8 a.m., and then I asked at 10 a.m., I asked, is the raza hard to deal with? Right? The, there's a predominantly Hispanic church, and I asked, is, is the raza hard to deal with? And 8 a.m., you guys are going to break the tie for me, all right? 8 a.m. said no. 10 a.m. said yes. Is that raza hard to deal with? Oh yeah, you better believe we're hard to deal with. We're special. Right? We are. Right? 
We're, we're difficult to deal with. If you don't think that we're difficult to deal with, I will challenge you on any given day, drive down Houston, drive on the side of the church on that side where the people from those apartments park, all those apartments park along the side of the church and look at the trash that daily is thrown on the, where, where they just decide to clean their cars and just throw it, throw it at the church. It's pura raza. You don't think we're difficult to deal with. Try being one of our ushers, telling someone with a, a baby that maybe is crying or something that, hey, you know, we could take them to the back or you know, we do have nursery. And, and, and see the attitudes that some of the ushers have to deal with if you don't think that we're difficult to deal with. You don't think we're difficult to deal with, you know, try being an usher saying like, hey, you know, for safety reasons, we can't have you do this or we can't have you do that. And, and see some of the attitudes that oftentimes uh, our ushers have to deal with. And so some people were like, no, we don't want to deal with them. But let me tell you that the greater blessing is serving where God calls you to serve. Rather it's with difficult people or not, right? Rather it's with difficult people or not. That's where the greater blessing is. That we would serve where God calls us to serve. You know, I'm fifth generation born and raised in Texas. English is my dominant language, my first language. I have two master's degrees. I could easily be serving a different demographic, a different community, or a different social economic community. But I understand, and I understand at an early age, that the greater blessing is always to serve where the greater need is, and the greater blessing is to always to serve where God has called us to serve. And so, so it's, it's important that we would learn this, that we would understand this. You know, one of the things, and again, I didn't even plan on the, on the testimony being about serving and that I was going to teach today about the, the obligations we have on serving. But, but if you paid attention, one of the things that um, Cynthia mentioned in her testimony was that um, we have a lot of special needs especially at 10 a.m., we have a lot of special needs kids in our, in our church. And um, we, we try our best to help as many as we can. Sometimes there's some that we just do not have the, the ability or the capacity to help, but we try and help as many as we can. But many of those kids require a one-on-one, -on -one, one volunteer per one of those students. And you know, there's a, there's a lot of people in church, 99% of the church, you know what they say? Uh, thank God for the sisters that are there serving, but that's not for me. Okay. Thank God for the ushers that have to try and keep a little bit of order during service so that new people can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but man, I, I could never do that, you know? And if they do it, they call my attention. I'm just going to give them an attitude. Thank God for those, those, sis, those brothers and sisters that show up Mondays at 8 a.m. to help clean the church. You know, as, as volunteers, they come in, they clean the church. But, you know, like that. Are you part of the family? I'm part of the family. We have obligations and we have commitments when we're part of the family. Right? My mom told me, hey, today you wash the dishes. I couldn't exactly be like, no, mom, you know, I mean, these hands are not made for washing dishes, right? I mean, I could tell her no, but if you grew up in a Hispanic household, <laughs> you know a little thing they call la chancla? <laughs> My mom said, amen. <laughs> She's a marksman. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And it's, it's the same thing in church. If God's put something in your heart to serve, to help, to do, do it. Don't, don't think that, like, that, that's for some, someone else. You know, I, I used to have some friends that used to come to our church, and one time, one time they brought a need before me. They're like, you know, this is what the church needs. And my response to them was, if you see that that's what the church needs, maybe God is calling you to meet that need. More than likely, God is calling you to meet that need because nobody else has seen it, but you saw it. As we say in Spanish, entrale. Get at it, go at it. Because we have obligations and we have responsibilities. And that's a small price to pay. A small price to pay when we understand the price that God paid so that we could be a part of the family. 
Yesterday, we went out to eat, and Raquel, our, our middle child, she's three years old, she said, Papi, are, are we rich or poor? I'm trying to get these girls in my life, mom and down, to spend less money. So I'm like, Mija, we're poor. <laughs> like, we're poor. She's three years old. You know what she told me? No. She goes, we have a couch, we have cars, we have um, uh, food, we have a park in the backyard. She means her swing set. She goes, we're rich. Now, I know you're right. You're right. I can't argue with that. I can't argue with that. But, you know, as they're growing, I want them to understand that cars and the couch. I don't know why she said the couch, but the couch and their swings, and their Barbies, and going out to eat, cost. And I'm providing, but they too have a responsibility. And Nayeli tells them, put up y'all's Barbies. They put them up. After they finish eating, they're, you know, five and three years old, Nayeli's like, put up y'all's dishes, and they go and they'll, they'll put them in the sink. One day as they grow, they're going to wash their dishes. They will grow in their responsibilities. They will grow in their commitments. Are you growing in your responsibilities? Are you growing in your commitments when it comes to the house of God, when it comes to the family of God, to being a, 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 a son? Remember, you're no longer an outcast. Jesus received the outcast. You're no longer a pariah. Jesus received you. You're no longer rejected. Jesus received you, just like he received this man that in the present, in the, in the culture that they lived in, probably had been rejected. Can you imagine how many times the family didn't get invited to a birthday party because nobody wanted to deal with him? Can you imagine how many times the family had to say, no, we can't go to that wedding or to that birthday party because of the struggle to deal with him? Of not being able to enjoy this because they're paying attention to this? or the snickering, or the, the pointing, or whatever goes on in, in those type of situations. Yet Jesus received him, pulled him away from the crowd, and dealt with him, just like he has received us, and just like he has dealt with us. Verse 36. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to tell, the more they spread the news. Verse 20, uh, 37. 37. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives a speech to the mute. That means to those who cannot speak. I'm going to tell you something. Not, it's not to offend anyone. But churches are filled with deaf and mute people. Right? Churches are filled with deaf and mute people. People. One of the miracles, and uh, we'll start seeing some pretty soon, but one of the miracles that Jesus does over and over in, in the Gospels is he gives sight to the blind. Right? The reason that, that those miracles are recorded in the Gospels is not just to, to glorify Jesus, which it is. It's not just to show the power and authority of Jesus, which he has, but it's also to show that there are a lot of blind people amongst us. There's one story where uh, Jesus prays for a man who is blind, and he asks him, what do you see? And the man says, I see men, but they look like trees. In other words, I see, but I really can't see. So then Jesus prays for him again, and that's how a lot of people are in church. Like, you see, but you don't see. And, and this miracle of a deaf and mute man is not just to show what Jesus did, but it's also to remind us that we too are deaf and we too are mute. Six times in the Gospels, seven times in the book of Revelation, Jesus says these words, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. He who has ears, let him hear. Right? In other words, we're here in church, but we hear, but we don't hear. Right? We hear, but we're not listening. Or we have as what we like to call selective hearing. I was thinking about my great-grandmother. She passed away, her and my great-grandfather. They lived to be 98 years old. 
And when she was older, like in her late 80s, early 90s, um, you know, she had, you know, certain people living at the house. Sometimes, you know, they were, they were just kind of freeloading, right? And um, so every time my mom or some of the aunts would go and visit, that they would get after, after, you know, my great grandparents, like, you know, you need to make them work. You need to make them go to school. You need to do this, this. You need to do that. And, and as soon as everybody would start complaining, my great grandma would just look at them like, and then she would go like, like, I don't hear nothing. And, and, and she's like, I, I'm tired. I'm going to my room. And so she would leave them talking, complaining, and she'd go to her bedroom. Right? Ah, in those days, if someone said they were going to go to Kmart, and she liked to sew, and she liked to knit and all that, she would come like, you're going to Kmart? Will you, will you, will you, you know, buy me some needles? Will you buy me some strings? I'm like, ah, mira, eso sí, oye. Like, right, all, all of a sudden, she could hear. Okay. Some of us were like that in church. We want to hear blessing. We want to hear prosperity. We want to hear encouragement. We want to hear that tomorrow you're going to sell 20 cars at work. <laughs> right? Some motivational speech like, yeah, man, oh, man, man. the pastor is on fire. But once we talk about repentance, once we talk about purity, once we talk about uh, not partying, once we talk about leaving the party scene, leaving the hookup scene, Working hard at work, being honorable, being respectful to, to your spouse, serving your spouse, providing for your family, being committed in the obligations uh, uh, to the family of God, being committed in the obligations that we have in church and serving, like all of a sudden, like, no oigo nada. I can't hear anything. He who has ears, let him hear. And then as I prepare to finish up, I will tell you that 99% of the church is mute. 99% of the church is those that cannot speak. Because we, we, and I'm not speaking French, <laughs> nosotros, we are called to preach the good news. Nosotros somos llamados para llevar las buenas nuevas, a predicar las buenas nuevas. Not just the pastor, no solamente el pastor. We, us, the church, the body of Christ, the fellowship of the believers, we are called to go and share and preach the good news. I like how my mom and the hermana Ortega are the only ones saying amen. The rest of y'all are kind of mute on me. <laughs> Let's try it again. We are called to go and share the good news. Can somebody help me with an amen? Amen. amen. Right. I'm going to share with you a verse in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. It'll be on the screens. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone, somebody help me out? Someone what? Tell, someone speaks. See, if we're mute, we're not telling them about Jesus. And if we're not telling them about Jesus, they're not hearing about Jesus. And if they're not hearing about Jesus, they cannot believe in Jesus. And if they cannot believe in Jesus, then they cannot be saved. Jesus came to heal the deaf so they could hear and the mute so you could speak. Let me say that again. Jesus came to heal the deaf so they could hear the good news. And he came to heal the mute so that you and I could preach the good news. Right? This is our calling. This is our obligation. And it's such a small price to pay considering that our destiny was hell. And Jesus saved us from hell to give us a seat at his table to be a son, to be a daughter of God. Small price to pay. Small price to pay. Some of you, you're, you're, you have parents that came from a third world country. Sacrificed to get here. So that you would get an education, rather that's a, that means a degree or certification or something, and get a, get a good paying job and contribute to the family. And many of you, you've understood that. And you think of the sacrifices of your parents. You think of the sacrifices of your grandparents. And you're like, you know, for me to keep my nose clean is a small price to pay. 
for us to share the good news, for us to pray for someone who's sick, for us to pray for someone that's demon possessed, for us to, to buy food for someone who's hungry, for us to clothe the naked, for us to visit the widow, to visit the, the orphan, to be there for them. It's a small price to pay for us to come to church, for us to worship, for us to study the word together, for us to give a tithe or offering or whatever it is that you give. It's a small price to pay considering what God paid. God didn't send a man. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send a prophet. He sent his only begotten son. He didn't pay with gold. He didn't pay with precious stones. He didn't pay, pay with Benjamins. He didn't pay with Bitcoin. Que ahorita no vale para nada. Right? He paid with the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. What a small price to pay. What a small price to pay. <laughs> Let's close our Bibles. Let's bow our heads. And I want to encourage you in this moment to thank God that you came to church today. Just simply start praying. Say, thank you, God, that I came to church. Thank you, Father, that I made it out here. If your family is with you, Thank God that your family came. What a tremendous blessing to come to church and have our families with us. Thank you, Father, that my family's here. I thank you that my mom's here and that uh, Ronnie and my nieces, Nayeli's here, Nelly and Jorge. Thank you that my dad was here earlier. Thank you, Lord. Would you be brave enough Would you be courageous enough to tell God, God, clean my ears out. Open up my ears that I would be willing to hear the truth. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Would you be courageous enough to just pray that right now? There where you're at, just pray that. Say, God, clear my ears, clean my ears out, open my ears that I may hear the truth, whether I like it or I don't like it, whether it's hard or it's difficult to deal with, clean my ears, clear my ears out, open my ears. I want to hear the truth. I don't want to shy away from it. I want to hear the truth. And then would you be courageous enough? Would you be brave enough to ask God to loosen your tongue? Would you say, God, loosen my tongue? God, will you give me the words I need to speak? God, let me preach so that they can hear and by hearing, they can believe and by believing that they would be saved. Right there where you're at, just pray that simple prayer to say, God, loosen my tongue. Give me the words to speak. Help me to speak truth with love. Help me to share the good news that you love us so much you sent your son to save us. God, help me to share that we don't have to be puppies or little dogs under the table. You're inviting us to be your son. You've invited us to, to be your daughters, to be your children. Father God, I put Pueblo's church in your hands. May we be a church, a church body that we never shy away from the truth, that we will always be willing to listen to the truth that comes through your word, through the scriptures and that we would never be ashamed or fearful or embarrassed or scared to share the good news. That we may all take the mandate of preaching so they can hear and by hearing they would believe and by believing they would receive salvation. In Jesus' name we pray in the name of Jesus, amen, amen.